Let's do this. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Jennifer, it's so nice to have you on the Fem Power Health podcast. And I don't know if you remember how we got in touch with each other. So I had been seeking out an expert to talk about how women's brains age over time. And because, you know, at our different life stages, different things happen and we have all these hormone shifts. I'm like, something must be going on with our brain. And so I was on LinkedIn and someone had attended a conference and based on what they wrote about the conference, I dug further and you were on the panel and I reached out to you and you said, yes, let's talk. And I think you're the perfect person um, to talk about this because you are studying um, the science of aging. And so thank you so much for joining us today. And why don't you tell us um, a bit more about yourself and how you got into this field? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate you having me. Uh, this is going to be fun, I think. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> so I am a PhD scientist. I have a research lab that I run at the Buck Institute which is an independent research institute that's wholly devoted to trying to understand mechanisms of aging. And that might sound a little odd to someone who's not really thought about it before. And just to be clear, we're not trying to get people to live to be 800, although there are, there are people on the planet whose goal <laughs> is in that realm. But our goal <laughs> is really to think about um, aging as a way to tackle diseases. So for most diseases of the modern world, and particularly for things that are really, um, um, sorry, I haven't had enough coffee. I'm so tired. <laughs> Hold on a second. I'm so sorry. No. I'm just like. You're the best. Okay. Um, I'll pick that back up from um, uh, aging as a risk factor. Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, so we think about aging as a risk factor for diseases. So for most chronic diseases, for most diseases of the modern world that are associated with age, age is actually the number one risk factor. So that means that for something like cardiovascular disease, well, we're all really concerned about what our cholesterol levels are and whether or not we get enough exercise. Um, in fact, your age is a much, much, much larger risk factor than any of those other things. And so what that means is that for things like cancer and neurodegenerative disease and um, cardiovascular disease and all of these other uh, things that plague us as we get older, age is the number one risk factor. And so if we can understand the mechanisms that underlie aging, what's causing it, what's driving it, then we can use that knowledge, we can exploit it to target all of those age-related diseases at the same time. And so I find that to be very compelling. As a scientist, you know, I want to work on something that that gets me up in the morning, that that you know gets me excited about facing my day. And and that was something that really resonated with me. That is an um, interesting <clears throat> problem to solve. And and I have to ask. So I want to ask you how you got into this, but just because you brought this up and just in case it's on other people's minds. When I hear aging is the number one risk factor, on the one hand, we want to live forever, but it sounds scary. Oh, my goodness. And I, I think logically we we know it. But when you say it, it's like, oh, my goodness, that's so scary to get older. Um, so I guess I'd love like a quick like reaction to that, because now I'm like, I don't want to age. <laughs> well, I, I would also say, um, you know, I would never want to go back to the time before I was 40. I feel that like I have a wealth of experience and knowledge that I, I deeply prize. Uh, and I can only imagine that gets better with age. Uh, so, so I think there's a lot of good, you know, it's just like anything else. There's good things and bad things about it. Um, I will say that I think we have some ideas about how to, how to age in a more healthy way. And unfortunately there's no magic bullet. Um, well, okay. The magic bullets are called diet and exercise. Um, but I think, you know, from my perspective, I was trained as a neuroscientist. So actually as a chemist, a cell biologist, and then a neuroscientist. And so the research that my lab works on is really like an amalgam. Uh, it's a mesh of all the things that I know and that I'm interested in. And so, um, I think about everything through the lens of the brain. <laughs> so it's very important for all of your listeners to understand that I am deeply, deeply biased. 
So everything I'm going to say is going to come through that lens. Um, and as a, as a neuroscientist, I think the brain is, is pretty much the master controller for every physiologic system in our bodies. And um, I've said this before, it's, it's not ruling as a dictator. It's constantly listening to and integrating feedback from the rest of the body. So there's just like ongoing dynamic conversation between the brain and every other organ in the body. And it's mediated by chemicals. Um, I, I would think about them kind of like messengers. And they can carry messages that are kind of like whispered, right, between two cells that are right next to each other. Um, or they can carry messages that are broadcast, you know, like, like radio announcements. And um, all, but all of that different kind of communication is mediated by chemicals or by proteins that are traveling back and forth between your organs. Right. And so that's kind of where I landed um, in this, this marriage between my background and, and my training. Wow, that's awesome. And, you know, look, if you have a bias on um, the brain being the center of it all, that's okay. Because what I, I pride myself on, honestly, with FemPower Health is interviewing different experts with different perspectives. And quite honestly, I do believe the brain, um, you know, is kind of the root of it all as well. Um, but it's, again, just always helpful to hear so many perspectives. So um, we we had the pleasure. So normally I don't do prep calls, but... Um, we just had like an intro, get to know you call first. And it ended up being a short 10 minute call because I think you had to get a grant out, but we hit it off. And I just remember in that conversation, one of the things um, we discussed is how we all think of the gut brain connection. We hear that so much, right? And, you know, here at FemPower Health, I, I try to focus on women's health um, more so because it hasn't been studied enough and it's underfunded and we are different than men. Our hormones operate differently, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you know, you talked about the connection between the ovaries and the brain. Um, so, so talk to us about about that connection. Oh yeah. Well, I, okay. So I think um, I know it's a big first question. Of all, no, no, no. I mean, this is what we work on. Um, I think the brain is. Um, ultimately controls every aspect of physiology and that extends to female physiology. And we call it reproductive circuits or reproductive function. Um, but maybe we can come back to this point. I think we need different language around those organs because they do more than reproduction. But using the language that we have, um, you know, all of the neuronal circuits in a woman's brain um, that control reproduction that extends from, you know, puberty to menstruation, to fertility, to conception, to pregnancy, to childbirth, to lactation, to child rearing, all of that um, is really about um, how the brain is connected to those organs. And again, there's this ongoing conversation in both directions. And when you start to think about reproductive function through the lens of the brain, um, suddenly a lot of things come into focus. So, you know, there's lots of different regions in the brain and they're all talking to each other in different ways. And um, the part of the brain that houses the neurons that are really important for reproductive function in females um, is in the hypothalamus. So it's this tiny little structure at the base of your brain that's about, I don't know, the size of a grape in a human. Um, but what's really cool about that area is that it's um, incredibly neurochemically diverse, meaning that it it makes and utilizes hundreds, um, at least dozens, if not over a hundred of these chemical signals um, or protein signals or lipid signals. So it makes a lot of a lot of those words in the chemical conversation that's going back and forth. And the neurons that control reproductive function are kind of intermingled with and somewhat overlapping with other um, circuits that control homeostasis. And when I'm talking about homeostasis in this context, what I'm talking about is organismal homeostasis. So what that really means is the systems that keep your body functioning within a certain range. Um, so things like energy balance, fluid balance, um, body temperature re regulation, um, circadian rhythms, those are all in the same area of the brain. And 
Um, so when you start to then think about all of those things I mentioned with respect to reproductive function, suddenly things become a little bit more clear. So, you know, these circuits also play a really important role in regulating things like behavior and mood. And so when you think about the constellation of like physical, but also emotional symptoms that are associated with periods, with motherhood, with menopause, um, it, it starts to make sense. <laughs> um, because the part of the brain that controls these things is also overlapping with those reproductive circuits. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes 100% sense. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when you, when you talk about the behavior and the mood, um, is it like how I don't know if, if um, like, how does it play a role between the hypothalamus and the hormones? Like, is it a chicken and egg thing? Because, Ooh, you know, yeah, I, uh -huh. I know there's this whole um, aspect of, like right now in the media, there's so much about the workplace supporting women, like if they have severe period pain or mm -hmm. through the um, stages of menopause. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've talked to even HR folks where they're like, well, if it doesn't help the men, we can't support it because everything has to be equal. But I mean, in this case, there's a genuine difference and a genuine impact. And so, mm -hmm. you know, there's this, this interesting acknowledgement that we need to make where we do have these changes happen because of the hormones. And I think a lot of us would prefer <laughs> it not happen. Um, so, you know, again, like how would we, I guess, reconcile that and how does all that play a role? Uh, well, let's uh, maybe start with the word hormone. Is that okay yep. with you? Let's, let's just go start for with it. The basics. Um, so what, what do you actually, what do you think hormone means? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot or anything. No, but... I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a very fair question and I haven't even ever thought about it that way. I mean, I, I think of hormone as we have X, Y, Z hormones, like mm -hmm. um, estrogen, testosterone, et cetera, and they mm -hmm. change throughout our life cycle. So there are the hormones and then the functions that they have. So that's honestly how simplistically I've thought about it, but I'm sure no, you have a that's much great. more holistic and advanced <laughs> definition. Well, I mean, sure, I could talk about it for hours, but but really at, 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 it's important to think about what it is we're talking about. So the things you just named, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, those are steroid hormones. And the word steroid just refers to literally one of the building blocks of these chemicals. So they all have the same kind of chemical core, and then they have different pieces that are dangling off of them that make you, make them distinct. Um, <clears throat> but the core is called a steroid. And um, those are small molecules, um, and they are hormones. And the word hormone to me, I think the easiest way to encapsulate what they, what they are is they are the messengers. So they carry messages either between, <clears throat> you know, distant regions in the same organ or between different organs in your body. Does that make sense? Yes. So you could interchangeably use the word messenger <laughs> with the word hormone. And hormone is a really broad term uh, from a scientific and medical perspective. So it refers to not just steroids, which is one kind of small molecule chemical, um, but to literally anything that can carry messages inside your body. <laughs> so that could be proteins, it could be peptides, it could be lipids, it could be gases, it could be small molecules of different kinds. Um, and so hormone is a really like a catch-all term for a messenger. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the hormones that we think about most are the ones that you named, I think, when we're talking about ovarian function. Um, but what's important to understand is that ovaries are endocrine organs, right? So everyone is super familiar with what they do with respect to fertility, right? We all know the downstream consequences of ovarian aging in, in that regard. So that can mean things like miscarriages or birth defects and uh, infertility. Um, but on the other side of things, ovaries have lots of functions that have nothing to do with reproduction. So as endocrine organs, they secrete, they make and secrete a lot of different messengers um, that are signaling to literally almost every tissue in your body and maintaining your overall health. So they make molecules that signal to your bone, to your brain, um, to your muscles, to your heart. And 
when they stop working in the middle of a, a woman's life, that has profound implications, not just for fertility, but also for overall health. And that's really where my research is focused. But coming back to this idea about hormones, um, men also have hormones. <laughs> so, you know, men also have these signaling molecules that, that carry messages between their organ systems. And some of them are shared, um, but the same molecule can have different functions between individuals, but they can also have really different functions um, between the sexes. So understanding all of those inter-individual differences and also um, intersex differences, I think um, is really important. And we're woefully behind on this, um, partly because of really insufficient funding, I think partly because of sex bias in research, right? We've been using the male body as biology's baseline for a hundred years, partly because of taboos, right? Societal taboos around talking about women's bodies. But the good news is that that's all changing. And in the last five to 10 years, and particularly around the question you asked, you know, about uh, employers wanting to provide services for that are specific for women in the workplace and in midlife, um, or or women around their menstrual cycles, that stuff didn't exist five plus years ago. So there's a, a real, there's a like taboos are being shattered and there's a real moment happening right now where, where things are changing in a good direction. So the message is positive. Yeah, no, it's helpful to, it's helpful to hear because I, I went on one of the many websites that you have because of all the great work you're doing. And um, just for those wondering about how bad it had been until all these changes now, 1% um, of biopharma investment goes to female specific conditions beyond cancer. 20% of basic science research um, includes female animals. And 10.7% 10 10 of the NIH 2020 budget went to women's health research. Um, so it's definitely, things are definitely getting better. I know some of this is older data, but not that old. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, the biopharma investment has gone up to like just under 4%, which is like bananas yeah. and also ridiculously low. <laughs> yes. I, I know. Right. It's like, it's like what quadrupled, but still only yeah. 4%. So it depends <laughs> Almost on quadrupled. I... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so it, de it depends. Um, so, okay, so we're talking about aging. I just wanted to jump into a couple of specific um, things, just going back to the fun facts. Um, and maybe this is out of order, but it's on my notes and it came to mind. So I just want to bring this up. So, you know, there were a couple of fun facts that had me ask some questions based on this whole aging, just to bring to light maybe what all this could mean and, and create like a specific example. So there's mm -hmm. two facts. One was that women go through menopause going through menopause later tend to live longer as do their male siblings. And then the other is ovaries show signs of aging decades before other tissues. Yeah. Um, so let's start with the first one about the menopause. The first thing that came to mind is an interview I did on POI, which is Premature ovarian insufficiency. Some have called it primary ovarian insufficiency. Um, and so immediately I thought of these women and like I, um, I probably had it. Um, I had four years of infertility, very big struggles. Um, and so if you're POI, you're tending to go through this earlier. So what should women make of that? And what is late menopause versus early? Like, how do we define that timing? Because I think all this is so important. And, and I have to bring this up. Menopause is now the hot topic in women's health. Thank goodness. I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'll am i start with that last point. I think um, that is so exciting to me. And yes. when we started, you know, three and a half, four years ago, um, when people would ask me what I wanted like if everything went the way I wanted it to go, what would be my dream scenario? Um, it was that I wanted this to be a conversation around every dinner table. I wanted it to be on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. I wanted it to be something that was normalized and also recognized as important, not just for women 
um, and not just for young women or older women, but literally important for everybody on the planet. And I think we're kind of getting there. Oh it's yeah. It's just like, <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing. Um, all right. So backing into your other questions, um, there's a, well, there's a lot to unpack there. I think, um, let's start with, uh, age at menopause. So what you're really talking about is what we call reproductive span. And again, I really think we need new language around yes. this because we're talking about more than reproduction. But what we're talking about is the age of menopause and um, how that relates to overall lifespan, right? So that you have reproductive span and then you have lifespan. And there are several studies that have shown uh, a correlation between age at menopause, age at natural menopause, I should say, which is distinct from what you were talking about with POI or POF. Um, so age at natural menopause is correlated with overall lifespan. Now that doesn't mean that if you go through menopause early that you're destined to die early. It's a correlation, it's a population average, but it does mean <clears throat> um, it does mean that there's some, well, and what you said is also true, age at, age at menopause also carries through, that correlation with lifespan carries through to male siblings. Um, so that means that there's a genetic component to all of this that's important for both men and women. Um, so understanding why ovaries are aging prematurely, and they really are, is important for everyone. Um, and so, yeah, you mentioned um, that ovaries are the, one of the first organs in the body to age. And in fact, if you think about it from the perspective of, you know, just generally functioning healthy women, um, somewhere in late 20s, early 30s, uh, ovaries start to show overt signs of aging, meaning that they're already considered um, geriatric by the medical community. And doctors have moved away from using that term, thank God. But it's kind of profound to imagine that when your body is functioning somewhere near peak performance, that your ovaries have already started to um, age. And you can put, you can try to put a clock on it. Um, if we characterize function, then ovaries are aging at about two and a half times the rate of the rest of the tissue in my body, um, which is crazy. So, you know, from a purely scientific perspective, ovaries are fascinating because they are a model for accelerated human aging. And we should study them the same way that we study other accelerated models of human aging. Um, but we don't know why. So that's the important thing to drive home here. We do not understand what is the driving factor or what is the cause of ovarian aging. And if we could understand that, then we could find interventions to delay it. And again, I just want to make very clear that I'm not talking about making women have babies when they're 70. It takes a lot more than functioning ovaries to have a healthy um, offspring. But what I am talking about is preserving that endocrine function. So preserving some of those hormones, those messengers that are so important for general health. I think on the non-reproductive side of things, a lot of women don't realize that menopause dramatically increases risk of heart disease, stroke, cardiovascular disease, uh, osteoporosis, uh, cognitive decline, autoimmune disease, arthritis. There's just a whole load of things that overnight your risk goes up when your ovaries stop working. Yeah. So from my perspective, I think it's really important to understand what those driving factors are behind a very aging. Now, yeah. I feel like I missed a piece of your question. So no, because I had a part it. two. I had a part two. Okay. Well, I guess for for women with POI, just a point of clarification, and again, I don't want to belabor mm -hmm. it because I can't get detail oriented. So Tasha, okay. if you want to edit this hey. out, that's okay. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, you know, so I know that if women have hysterectomies, that's a medical, um, medically induced menopause. But if someone has POI, that's not a medically induced, but it's how their bodies work. Doesn't that mean that they are like very, very early menopause? Yeah. Um, and POI can be caused by all kinds of things, um, including things like um, chemotherapy, right? That, that really um, dramatically impacts a woman's ovarian function. Um, and, and for the most part, POI or POF, um, however you refer to it, 
uh, can be unexplained, right? We don't necessarily understand what the underlying causes are. What we see are the downstream consequences. And yes, it, 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 it is akin to an early menopause. And what's, what's fascinating, you know, when I first started working in this space, because I sort of backed into reproductive aging, um, I, I'm interested in the conversation between brain and lots of different organs, but we came to the ovaries. And once I started learning about them and realizing how little was known, like there's, there's nothing I like, there's nothing that could keep me from trying to understand this. But when you think about POI and POF, the medical community treats that as a catastrophe, right? I mean, there are a, a woman who is in her twenties who suddenly has her ovaries stop working and it starts to experience things like osteoporosis and heart disease. Um, the medical community treats that like a catastrophe and absolutely puts her on hormones, replacement therapy, if that's an option, um, and does all kinds of other things to try to mitigate those health impacts. Whereas if it happens 20 years later, we don't do anything really. <laughs> You so know, a, that this is, is a natural part of, of, of life and, you know, you're just right. roll with it. It's a, such right. a strange thing because <laughs> it's literally the same set of symptoms. I never the thought about difference. it. <laughs> the only difference is the age of the patient. Um, so, so that for me was kind of a wake up call. And I was, uh, when I was first starting to learn about, about this stuff. And it's maybe something important to keep in the back of your mind when you're thinking about whether or not this is uh, this is something worth pursuing. <laughs> Interesting. So here's a question for you because, um, you know, and I think you'd be a great person to ask this question: Is our bodies are made to have children, right? And you know, this is you know, there's the philosophical side of you know should women bear children? I, I think it's a power of choice, right? I just did a very cool episode um, on a woman who chose not to have children and she wrote a great book and um, just, it was such a fascinating conversation. So aside, uh, you know, aside from people making choice and people's opinions about women who have or don't have children, um, is there research on the impact of this healthy aging based on whether you have children, how many children you have, and when you have children. So, I, and also if it's an IVF baby or not, which I think it's too early to look at that research. Cause like I think of um, my family. So, my grandmother, she had 15 kids. Um, <laughs> Did her uterus <laughs> fall out? <laughs> no, but um, one of them died, I think, early on. Um, and the 14 survived. And my dad was the second eldest. And um, what's so cool, I just have to say, she escaped Hungary in the 70s when she was 50 years old. So she lived till 100, literally half her life in Hungary and half in freedom in the United States. And so she just died in May. And wow. then I think of me who thought that I would have tons and tons of children I started, um, I got married at 35 and started to try right away and had a proactive doctor learned right away I was going to have fertility issues. I now wonder how my path would have changed had that not happened because um, mm -hmm. I think that created stress. But nonetheless, it took four years and I had my son at 41. So you have literally two completely separate cases where my grandmother's last child was probably born in her early 40s. My mm -hmm. first and only child came at the age of 40. And I'm so curious, like, what does all that mean? And again, I know there's nuances with genetics, et cetera, but I'm just so curious if there's ever been data around this whole impact of having children, not when you have them, if it's an IVF um, baby, like, what do we know so far about that whole combination? Yeah, those are really fascinating questions. And many of the answers um, that I give to questions like that are the same, which is, we don't know. Um, we know some things, uh, lots of things we don't know, simple things like you should, you would think that we should know the answers to every single one of those questions. The reason that we don't is because we literally have not collected the data um, for all of the reasons that we've already touched on. And so, you know, this, this is part of what we're trying to fuel discovery around. 
Um, in terms of uh, IVF, so we don't have, we really don't have good data there. And not because it doesn't exist. Um, you know, the IVF industry is, uh, is deeply concerned with keeping themselves in business. And so a lot of the research money that has gone into the IVF fields is really focused around making IVF better. Um, I'm not aware of any data set that has followed longitudinally those early IVF um, children in a way that would give us comprehensive data sets that would tell us the answer to those questions. Um, I hope and I think that that data is now being collected. So stay tuned. Okay. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I think whatever the answer is, uh, IVF has been, a, you know, a godsend for a lot of people. And I think um, many women wouldn't have biological children without it. So as much as I'm not a fan of the IVF industry, I think that, you know, it's kind of amazing that we have it. But it is a Band-Aid, right? Trust like, me. After it's doing... Well, you know, this is why I started the podcast because yeah. I, 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 because I got into the details of women's health through my own journey and learning about my body does. and everyone when, does, I know. Right. And, yeah. and so as I did, the, I will never forget how I switched from focusing on fertility to broadening to women's health. There was a post on Reddit and there was a woman who was in her early forties. She had two embryos left. And she posted, should I use both or one? I constantly have miscarriages. I wrote to her and I said, you are asking the wrong question. You need to know why you're having miscarriages and then make decisions, not how many embryos to use. And that was when I was realized we're all focused on making embryos and putting them in our body. But how often are we asking why? And then as I started digging, I'm like, we don't know anything about we don't anything. Know anything. It's ridiculous. And this is, I should say, that we are not talking about things that are so difficult to understand. We literally just haven't done the research. Yeah. Um, it is happening now. I mean, that's yes. part of the reason yes, that exactly. we started the consortium, which we can talk about later or not at all. But um, I... You know, I put the word equality into the name of this nonprofit because I think that it truly is an issue of equality. I think that the fact that women go through this reproductive decline in midlife, whether or not they want to have biological children, I personally don't have children, but that was a choice. Um, I, and yet, from the moment I went through puberty, essentially, but at, at every moment in my adult life, I have had to think about in the back of my mind, this ticking biological clock when I was thinking about my career, when I was thinking about my education. Uh, and as I start to approach perimenopause and menopause, you know, these things are going to have an impact on my daily ability to function in my job and in my life. And men simply don't have that. And so understanding what those driving factors are that underlie ovarian aging and then looking for ways to mitigate those health consequences and those things that happen that are related to the endocrine function of the organ. I think this is something that is like just so important. Yeah, no, I completely um, I agree. Back to, you, um, I didn't actually get to all of your question. Um, can you steer me back <laughs> Well, there was one where I had asked about, um, you had talked already about the ovary showing signs of aging decades before other tissues. But when I read that as one of the facts, my immediate reaction was how, like, could trauma also impact ovarian aging? Like, do we Everything. know that? Yeah. Okay. Anything that impacts aging in the rest of your body can also impact aging in your ovaries. So certainly okay. um, any kind of stress, right? Stress is, chronic stress is in particular is, is not great for healthy aging. And that's true for ovarian function as well. The, the converse of that, which is heartening, is that things that we know that might impact aging in the rest of the body also seem to impact ovarian aging. So that's good in, in two directions, meaning that if we can understand why aging or why ovaries are aging prematurely, 
then those interventions are likely to have an impact on the rest of the body. And those mechanisms that we discover will also potentially be important for aging the rest of the body. So again, there's a reason to look beyond male, female, and to just think about them as an amazing system that nature has given us to try to understand uh, accelerated aging. Um, there was something else you asked though, that I really wanted to come back to. And um, maybe I, I can't remember what it was though. Sorry. It might be one of those where we don't think about it and uh, it'll come back to you. So when it does, just let me know and we'll, we'll okay. get back to it. So um, one question I also wanted to ask is the HPA axis. Mm -hmm. So is that simply the um, discussion we had about the hypothalamus, or is there more to it that we need to discuss? Because I know some folks have asked me, can you please cover this topic? And so- Oh, it, sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I will say that, so HPA or HPG, that you can use those kind of interchangeably the same way that you were saying POI or POF, um, refers to the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, or gonadal axis. Um, and so that that's really like brain. So hypothalamus talking to pituitary, which is um, uh, an endocrine organ, talking to your gonads, which means your ovaries and your uterus um, in women. And that is really like the classic circuit and it, it goes in both directions. Classic hormonal circuit that controls things like your um, ovulatory cycle, your menstrual cycle, um, pregnancy, things like that. So that uh, that axis is obviously clearly important, no question about it. Um, but I would say for the last 40, 50 years, all of the research that's gone into the central brain control of reproductive function has hyper-focused on the HPG axis kind of to the detriment of understanding other things. Um, and so I think we know a lot about that pathway, um, but there's a lot of other potentially important pathways of communication that we don't understand that we haven't even yet discovered. So if you think about um, the kind of conversation that I was talking about between brain and reproductive organs being mediated by chemicals, if the chemicals are the words in that conversation, then there are words that we haven't yet discovered. So the ovary is probably making lots of things that we don't even know about yet. Um, that's part of where my lab is focused. Um, so uh, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that to yeah. that makes total sense. Okay, no, I'm, I'm glad I asked the question because, Good. you know, it, 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 and this is actually the a perfect interview to ask it because, um, it now makes sense that there's been so much, because you're right, I read about it all the time. And this is the first time that we're talking about the connection between the ovaries specifically and the brain. And um, I think this is a, this type of specific conversation is so important because it clearly isn't happening enough. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, so we age, it's a normal part of life. And you know, what struck me also is when we were talking about POI or POF, about how doctors can do things to mitigate the potential impacts. Um, and when we are in our 40s, 50s and, and hit menopause um, at the more typical average time, maybe that focus isn't there, but nonetheless, there's still things to mitigate these potential um, changes to our body that are going to be, you know, to different degrees in, in every woman. So you know, I know this is, this is a, we want to optimize and better understand aging to help with a lot of these potential diseases rather than allowing us to live to be 800. Um, <laughs> so what are some of the, the realistic things that people should be looking at now that, um, yeah. So what, like, I guess, what are these factors based on today that we can do so that people aren't afraid of, oh my goodness, I'm aging and all these things are going to happen to me? Well, like I said at the beginning, um, everyone wants a magic bullet, but the magic bullet so far, and it, we just keep getting this message over and over and over again through lots of studies um, around aging in humans, is that what you put into your body... <laughs> And how you use your body 
um, are probably the most impactful things that you can pay attention to. So what you eat and um, how much and what kind of exercise you get. Uh, those are the things that are within your control right now. <laughs> and those are the things that are, you know, can clearly have a, a benefit to both to aging in, in your whole body, but also aging in, in your ovaries. Um, if you're, you know, in perimenopause or approaching menopause, there's a conversation to have with your doctor around whether hormone replacement therapy might be something that you want to consider. And this is a place where it's super important to acknowledge that number one, I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm not giving advice, um, but also to acknowledge that uh, this is female reproductive physiology, but female physiology in general is one of the most complex signatures in all of human health. And so we need to treat it that way. And it's incredibly variable at the level of an individual. So your cycles and my cycles are completely different. Whether or not I can take HRT and, or you can take HRT, also completely different. Dependence on environment, dependence on genetic predispositions, dependence on a lot of things. And again, that's where it's important to have a conversation with your physician. But thinking about that uh, variability means that, you know, you you want to pay attention to what's right for you. And hormone replacement therapy is another band-aid. So much like IVF, it's imperfect. Um, it has been maligned <laughs> because of a study that came out a long time ago that was, um, that was wrong. Um, that actually, it wasn't even that it was wrong. It was that there was a lot of misinformation spread through the media about it. And that misinformation persists to today. Yep. Um, and, you know, we can go down that rabbit hole if you want to, I'm happy to talk about it, but the, the, maybe the important take home message is that, um, we don't know all those words. We don't know the full lexicon in that conversation between brain and ovaries, but we do know some of them, right? The HPG axis was established around them. That is estrogen, progesterone, things like um, inhibin, FSH, AMH, these things that we know about that are part of that axis, um, you can certainly measure. And some of them you can try to put back, right? You can try to replace some of a few of the things that ovaries make that are important for general health and estrogen is a big one. Um, now, having said that, I think lots of women um, try HRT and then stop because it's kind of applied like a sledgehammer with like a one size fits all approach. And it's one of those places where personalized um, thinking about like how it's delivered, what's in it, how much of each thing is in it, that needs to be personalized for every person. And there's also a sweet spot of timing when you start it. So, um, you know, there's real clear data that, um, if you start it too late after menopause, then it can have a detrimental effect. So again, it's really important to have a conversation with your doctor, but there's no question. There's overwhelming data in tens of thousands of women um, who are able to take HRT, that it has a dramatic positive impact on all of those things we talked about in terms of cardiovascular health, in terms of reducing osteoporosis risk, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. So no, absolutely. And yeah. you know, when you were saying about how it's so individualized, you know, I can't emphasize this enough is because it is so complex. We as women really need to take ownership around monitoring what's happening to our body. And I think what's hard is we don't know what we don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I think back to like early in life, right. When you have period pain, like how much of it is normal and you know your own body. And so that's normal. And like how much is heavy bleeding? And now it goes into menopause. You know, I think it, I, I see so many of my friends will complain about, oh, I'm having so much anxiety. Oh my goodness. Now I'm drinking red wine and I get a migraine. And, but like mm -hmm. none of them are putting it together that that's what it is until we all start talking to each other and realize everyone in our age group is dealing with this. Oh my goodness. It must be a stage of life type of thing. Um, right. And that's also why I do the podcast is trying to create awareness of like what a typical normal is so that you can at least gauge, but then also 
go to your doctor, right? So like yeah. I think about my recent OBGYN appointment because of the podcast and all the wonderful guests that I have, I've been monitoring my cycle. Um, and I know a lot of people do it more so when, you know, they're trying to avoid pregnancy or get pregnant. Um, but I did it because I needed to know when I was getting into menopause. So 16 months after I um, had my last period, I got my period again, twice. Oh. And oh, no. I attributed it to this magical vacation, um, mm -hmm. joking around that the day I hiked um, the birthing cave in Arizona, I got my period back. So I was like, <laughs> okay. So I thought it was like just this funny thing, but my OBGYN- That's OB not an advertisement I know. for that cave. I know, right? <laughs> Or that hike. I know, that's true. But nonetheless, um, you know, when I went to my OBGYN, I had explained this. And so right away she said, we need to do an endometrial biopsy and a oh. vaginal ultrasound. And oddly enough, I started having breast tenderness around the time I saw her. And I know all this is estrogen, estrogen, estrogen. And so um, we did the tests. Um, I also rushed a mammogram because I was panicking, admittedly. <laughs> It's like, where, when can I get one now? I can't wait till November. And luckily everything turned out fine. Um, but I was able to have that conversation with her. And I had asked about like vaginal estrogen. And she said, we're not giving any of that to you until we get these tests. Um, and so luckily it all turned out, but I was able to have that conversation. And had I not told her all these things, I might not have had the test. Yeah, I mean... I literally every woman I know, and particularly women who are working in this space, either as scientists and doctors or on the, you know, on the other side of things, um, like you, I, almost everyone has a personal story and, and they come to this because they're struggling to figure out what's happening. And they are confronted with just the dramatic lack of information and knowledge that we have. And then suddenly it's like, whoa, <laughs> wait a second, this is not okay. And we need to change this. Um, so, you know, again, it sucks that we're here, but things are changing. And, um, you know, I just remembered some of what you asked me that was um, Go for it. interesting to, to touch on. Um, coming back to this idea about how dependent it is on the individual, um, the age of natural menopause is considered normal if it's between the ages of 50, 40 and 54. So it spans like normal spans of 14 year window, which is crazy if you think about it. I mean, I think of puberty as being something that's kind of like a big window, but that's like three to five years, 14 years is considered normal. And so understanding that intra-individual variability just by itself would give us a lot of clues about what the underlying causes of right, ovarian aging are. The other question you asked that is really fascinating, but for which I think we, the jury's still out in a lot of ways is the relationship between whether a woman has children or not, and if she has children, how many children she has and her overall lifespan. Um, there's a correlation between um, the age at which a, a woman has her last child, if she has children, um, and lifespan, but that is really just kind of, I think about it as like a proxy for reproductive span, right? If you have a child, you're probably still reproductively active. <laughs> um, and so it's kind of like a proxy for age at menopause, but there's a lot of research going on right now to, to ask these sorts of questions. And it's fascinating. It, it, it really is. So going back, I, you know, I thought about this. So again, my original ask was, I'd like to find an expert to talk about how our brain ages over time. Mm -hmm. So to close the loop, that's not the right question, is it? <laughs> right? Yeah. That was the wrong question <laughs> because it's it's the it's the brain ovary connection and is it really the the ovaries? Like it's a it's a chicken and egg, like I think it's both. I think it's both too. Um, I mean, obviously that's, that's why I'm working on this. Um, I, I think, I think we have to understand both. And I think we have to understand how that conversation changes with age. Um, we don't know a lot about that. Uh, we know again, like the big, the big four or five, um, that we always talk about, but even that, I would say there's a lot of limitations around, um, how we measure these things. Um, 
around the data sets that exist. Like we don't have huge large scale data sets that really look at a granular level, at a detailed temporal level, how these things change in, in large numbers of women. And that research is just getting started, a lot of it. Um, but again, it's, it's a positive message. Well, it's good to know that more and more people are focusing on the research and that there are solutions now. So women, you know, we don't have to worry, oh my goodness, I'm aging. This is horrible. Like there are lots of things that can be done. It's about having, you know, a, a proactive mindset. And also one other thing I just have to mention because I get so many messages about this. Okay. Please go to NOMS, which is the North American Menopause Society and find an OBGYN through that because they are certified in menopause. And there's also a lot of startups that um, are focusing in this space. So you can research those. Um, but if anyone is frustrated and you're in that stage of life, please check out these amazing resources because they can help you find the care if your clinician is not particularly trained in this particular stage of life. So I just had to yeah. give that plug. Can I, <laughs> I, um, can I add one more? Please. Um, I would add more, one more to that, and that's the National Menopause Foundation, so NMF. And um, I'm, I'm on their clinical advisory board. Uh, I think that they're doing amazing work. They only started a few years ago, but it was it is the first nonprofit um, that's only focused on the patient. So NAMS is a professional organization that uh, handles, uh, that's basically uh, made by physicians. Um, so they definitely have a lot of great information on their website and you can find a doctor there, but uh, National Menopause Foundation is just there for patients. So they have kind of a cool portal where women can talk to each other um, and get like peer support, but they also have a, a podcast and a lot of information and, and they also have um, information about physicians and things like that. But yeah, awesome. knowledge is really important and, and paying attention to where you're getting that knowledge from is also important. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. Thank you. So I, I guess, um, what is your hope for the, the future? Um, I know it's like, let's figure out all this data, but <laughs> if you were to like yeah. succinctly yeah. summarize what, oh. what your hope is, <laughs> oh, my hope if that's is possible. Like, oh, well, yeah. Um, I'll tell you, this is my goal. We want to, um, we want to, understand what's driving ovarian aging so that we can sync up aging in ovaries with aging in the rest of a woman's body. That's it. That's what's what we want to do. Um, and so what we fund dictates what we know. Um, and so right now I'm hyper-focused on increasing funding in the space. And part of that is through the GCRLE that we started, which gives away grants to scientists and is really engaging an army of people to work on this. Um, and that said, part of what we do is we're trying to build out the ecosystem around that research space so that we can accelerate translating those basic science discoveries from the lab into women's hands faster. And a big part of that is you um, and the people listening. So we want to have ambassadors who spread the word about what we're doing and, and really who just help us put forward information so that, you know, women who have questions actually know where to get answers from. And awesome. Then, well, yeah. I will add them to the website if I haven't already. I may have, because I now changed the website where you can um, find either your life stage or a given topic. And all the episodes I've done, the research that I've done, it's all like organized now so people can find it because Otherwise, you're just getting the latest episode in your feed and may not find what you're, you need. So um, I will make sure that they're there. Um, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And I will also add in the show notes all the ways to be able to connect with you. Um, so I'll make Go sure, ahead, sure. Um, I align with you and the wonderful Allison, who um, has been working <laughs> so wonderful. hard behind the scenes. Like, yeah. I just really appreciate her so much. And so I'll just make sure we, so do I. Um, yes, <laughs> we, no we connect. Um, <laughs> So everyone check out the show notes uh, for more details. And uh, thank you so much, Jennifer, for your commitment and for making time. Um, this was really fun. I feel like we need to do a part two and a part three over time as more research um, comes about. So I would be delighted to do that. And thank you for a re really fun conversation.